Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. Today's program has been brought to you by GreatBrewers.com a social media marketing platform dedicated to promoting the world's great brewers and the beers they create. For more information, visit greatbrewers.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. Hey, hey, welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. It's February 5th, 2013. That's our great new theme song by the Beer Amigos. You can check them out. They're on Long Island. They have a podcast. Thanks so much. And hey, I'm here with Jen Swartman from Blind Tiger. How Hi, are Jimmy. you, Jen? I'm doing really well. How about you? It's always great having you on the show. It's, it's Jimmy great to Carboni. Be here always. Jimmy's number 43. And uh, thanks so much to GreatBrewers.com for sponsoring us. It's a great place to go to learn more about beer. Uh, our guest tonight is uh, one of your buddies and my buddies, Tommy yeah. Harder, the chef at Blind Tiger Ale House in uh, How are you our doing? fantastic West chef. Village. So uh, it, it, people don't usually associate beer bars with, with good food, but uh, you and Blind Tiger have, have been doing something that has taken people's notice. A couple of years ago, the New York Times, uh, Eric Asimov, wrote about good beer bars with food, and I know that Blind Tiger was mentioned. Um, how did you end up working at uh, Blind Tiger? And, and tell us about some of the dishes that you're, you're cooking with beer, because I know that's one of your specialties. Yeah, well, I actually um, – <clears throat> excuse me uh, – Working at uh, Blind Tucker, it actually all started basically just a, a answer to a Craigslist ad. Uh, came to an interview and was sitting there drinking a beer with the guys. I can <laughs> actually speak to the process to get to that point a bit because I know that Dave, you know, in as a visionary of the Blind Tiger, the one who, um, Dave Broderick, who's on the show a lot and who is our, like, you know, the main partner for the Blind Tiger just because it was his vision that created the beer bar back in 96 – He's always looking forward and has like great ideas. And he really saw that there was this niche that wasn't quite being filled in New York. And I mean, it's something that goes back to a lot of brew pubs, too, where it's really extraordinary when um, you have the combination of, of everything coming together. A really great chef who's really conscientious and really great brewers putting out really phenomenal beer. And when that comes together, it's magic. And a lot of times, you know, the, the food is just an afterthought. The beer is really That's what true. they're focusing on. Sometimes the opposite, where they throw in a brewery just for kicks, and it's really about the food. But when it's all, when you're paying attention to the quality of all of it, then it can really be fun and magical. And so we, in, this, in this case, we saw that beer bars in New York really were not embracing the food, you know, and so when we were at a crossroads and we were looking for a chef, I know from discussions I heard and just talking to Dave that he really was hoping to find the right fit and somebody who could take us up a notch and push us further because Louise, who designed the first menu, did a phenomenal job and we were suddenly known for our food in spite of ourselves because we really did you know, like have to have a kitchen in the new space when we moved. And so it's like, hey, can you, you went to culinary school. You want to design some food that goes with beer? And she did such a great job that it meant that we became known as a food establishment. And yet we still weren't taking it 
to like we weren't becoming more sophisticated with it and so that's when tommy came in and we were so lucky to find him so so you just answered a craigslist ad yeah it was really and, and i mean i didn't know anything much about uh blind tiger itself beforehand like i've only been in new york for probably about i'm a little over three years now but at the time i was only here for about a year and from where from um i actually moved from the caribbean i was down in uh turks and caicos islands before this working for Club Med uh, Resorts. And so I spent, well, uh, actually about two years uh, between Florida and the Caribbean. But before, before that? Um, before that, I, I go back to the West Coast. I'm originally from Idaho, but I grew up in Portland, Oregon. And that's where I kind of did most of my cooking. Guess what I'm doing right now. <laughs> and, uh, and he I'm also has pizza. a background. He worked for a, a brew pub out there, too. Yeah. So so I'm, I'm eating pizza. And then at Roberta's, they have great pizza. It's pizza with some meat on top. Wait, and we thought since Tommy was coming on, first we, we would eat with our beer today because we were usually drinking beer. And we started with, I had the Firestone Pale Ale, 31. And Jen, what did you open? The, the, oh, it's the... Uh, the winter the 13. winter thirteen from Hopton Dormal, Hopton and it's Dormal. it's a wet hopped Belgian farmhouse, and it's phenomenal. I've never had it before this moment, and it's really really nice. So I think that that eating with when I'm drinking is natural. I like to eat when I drink. So um, you know, let's go in that direction. So cooking with beer on on the on the menu at Blind Tiger. What dishes do you have that are made with beer? Oh, actually, I have uh, about six different dishes, um, especially during the winter time here. There's, I do a lot more of like slow roasted braising kind of items. So I have like two uh, items. I have a lamb shepherd's pie that's braised in beer. I take the lamb, the stew, and actually cook it in, in the beer. Um, with the blind tiger, there's definitely a lot of adaptations that have to go along with having such a small kitchen, all that kind of stuff. So. Instead of like using stocks and making stocks, I don't have a whole lot of space to do kind of stuff like that. So I do definitely have a great um, variety of beer to use. And so I can use the beer as a flavor base, as a liquid base for a lot of like the stews and all that kind of stuff I do. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, one of the probably one of the uh, most uh, uh, asked for dishes is actually a beer cheese soup that I make. And it's a potato beer cheese soup. But instead of using like any liquid or stock as like the base to make the soup, it's all beer. I usually use a combination of different beers, just kind of give out different nuances and kind of you know control the hoppiness and the uh, the bitterness if I use uh, certain beers or not. So, and what kind of cheese do you use? That one I just use it's a uh, short white cheddar. Um, so it's not you know everything's pretty really straightforward, very simple. It's just you know potatoes, onions, carrots, celery, and uh, beer and one cheddar cheese. But it is an awesome dish. Like every time I make it, I have people always going crazy for it. Every winter they're asking when I'm gonna bring it back and. It's definitely, yeah, it's taken on its own uh, just by, you know, using these different combinations of the beers as well. Um, on top of that, I always have my, um, it's now it's a Pilsner brined chicken wings. Uh, without having a fryer at Blind Tiger, we actually had to think kind of out of the box, and now we're going to do wings. And so um, one of the things is it's their fully baked wing. So we actually... They've been written up. We've yeah. gotten write-ups about those wings. Um Around Super Bowl time a couple of years ago, there was a big, like, you know, comparing wings, and they gave little chicken wings, and we got one of the top scores <laughs> for these wings, and they are, like, a, like perfect spiciness, you know, classic buffalo sauce, but the fact that they yeah. are not <clears throat> deep fried yeah, I mean, then, changes and, everything. They take a while sometimes. People they do. start getting antsy. I'm like, you know yeah. what? They are worth the wait. Yeah, they do. They do end up taking like 15 minutes to it every time we get an order for one. But we have to kind of let people know. It's like, yeah, well, you're waiting for the good quality. That's why they're, they're why they are. And uh, no, but we actually, so we brined them in, in Pilsner first. Um, just being like a lighter beer helps actually season the, uh, the meat and really add a lot of like juiciness to it as well. And you can almost kind of taste it. If you had a, a plain one, you could taste the beer in the meat itself. But just from soaking it in a salty beer solution for several hours, it you know creates a luscious, nice, juicy chicken be- chicken wing. So um, that was you know that's one of the uh, one of the main dishes. Um, another one that we do right now is uh, beef short rib SOS. And so what now I took is a classic SOS a dish that's usually was just like you know chuck beef on a piece blank of bread on a shingle. Yeah, blank <laughs> on what a shingle. Like he's, <laughs> he's talking SOS and. It's a military <laughs> thing, and I didn't know what he was talking about. Yeah, at it's first, a, a blank on a shingle, but I actually <laughs> turned it into a short rib on a uh, shingle. Yeah. Um, it's it not up. just like <laughs> dry. It's not like braised dry beef. Yeah, exactly. It's it is. They are rich and decadent. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what we do there is actually we take uh, usually a darker beer like a stout or a porter, um, which usually really goes really well with like you know, game your meat, and we braise beef short ribs in the stout beer. 
and then turn around and take that, that liquid base and make that into a mushroom gravy. Um, adding a bunch of wild mushrooms and stuff like that, uh, um, you know, level off that sauce. But, you know, using the liquid as also now it's the, the beer is the sauce based. You know, in, in certain countries, I mean, there's definitely beer cuisine, you know, Belgium, Germany. Yeah. When you're talking about the, the beer cheese soup, that's something that I've seen in a lot of German cookbooks. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's cool, like, as, as craft beer is expanding, like our friends J- Johnny and Jessica are important Spanish craft beers. We, we did a, a Spanish craft beer dinner last week. And uh, it was great to see how the flavors of you know Spain can meld with with beer. So I feel like you could, I feel like beer goes with all cuisines, um, and I, I I love hearing you talk about cooking with it too because I like to cook with it too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. When I first started cooking, I used to always cook with wine, and then once I opened Jimmy's Number Forty Three, same thing. Having beer around, I started putting beer in everything: tomato sauce, chili. Yeah. You know, I do a pasta with bacon and onions and beer and cream. Yeah, and I, I mean, I've played around, too, and I've actually made, like, instead of making, like, a beurre blanc sauce, I've made a, a mead blanc. So uh, you would basically think it's a white wine butter sauce, um, something that's really, you know, white and rich and usually kind of tangy. You kind of do it. Usually it goes really well with, like, you know, fish dishes and stuff like that. Um, I was just playing around because we have mead there at, at Blind Tiger, and I'm like, well, let me see if I can't make, like, a sauce out of this. And so it was just, you know, from, like, experimentation and kind of thinking outside the box and where I could – substitute beer or mead or you know some kind of alcohol base like that for something else that we would use wine. Okay, so let's say I'm cooking something like shrimp with, with garlic and I might finish it with white wine. What what beer is what I use to, oh, to finish it with instead of wine? Uh, instead of wine, I mean, you could definitely use um, with shrimp, you know, being it's a lighter uh, fish or lighter seafood, you know, you don't want to like overpower it with like a dark beer or something like that. So usually a lighter beer always will go really well with it. Um, something like even if you know, go to as far as doing like wit ale or um, you know, bel- somewhere like my Belgian. Oh, wit PA. would be good. A Belgian wit. Yeah, um, I would actually like to do with that too. Is like kind of making you're making like drunken shrimp or you know, camarones barracho. So you know, I'd like a Spanish dish, and it's something that's done in like you know, Latin cultures. And is stuff that a that. real dish, camarones barracho? Yeah, <laughs> um, but that usually you know they they use. I would I would get Mexican that dish <laughs> if that was on your menu. I would totally get yeah, camarones barracho. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it translates to drunken shrimp, but uh, I'm using like even more of like an amber and then and, like you also add a lot more spice and flavor for like you know kind of making more latin so like you know cumin and you know chili peppers they usually have a lot more flavor to them they, they go really well with like you know a lighter medium in the range of beers like i say amber's like always kind of be in the middle it's because of like the uh, not the flavor profile but the color profile they are darker beer is going to have more of like these coffee espresso notes where lighter beer is going to have you know can be a lot, you know, is almost the exact opposite you know, in, the, in the spectrum of things. But Amber's always kind of right into the middle, really lend themselves to go with really well with a lot of different things. And shrimp as well, like it's, uh, you know, it's, it's got its own flavor, but it goes, you can do it so many different ways that, you know, it depends on how you want to make a taste. And yeah, I would, I'd actually like to make that dish. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking you should cook five different shrimp dishes with five different beers. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. That would be. And see how are it there all any up. dishes at, at Blind Tiger that really stand out for you, Jen? That, that you really recommend to customers all the time. a lot? <laughs> um, well, fortunately, our menu now changes seasonally thanks to Tommy, and so we end up with kind of a rotation of things instead of one menu that people love but they kind of get tired of. One of the things he does instead of having a proprietary chili. He does a chili of the day, which oh, yeah. usually lasts a couple, a few days, yeah, depending yeah. on the season. Four or five days. So it lasts four or five days, and then he'll switch it out and do something different. And it's really fun because just when I think, like, oh my gosh, there's no way he's going to outdo himself, the next one comes around, and it's like, how how do you keep doing this? You know, so that's really fun and always different. And people look at that and the grilled cheese of the day, yep. you know, that changes. Well, that's but, fun. Um, grilled cheese of the day. I like that. Yep. But yeah, I mean, then there's some brunch items. We have a Sunday brunch. It's only on Sunday at this point. I don't work on Sundays anymore, so I miss it most of the time. But there's this, like, there's, I can't remember what you call it. The, uh, the, the brotherly love. The, yeah. The dish that I made for my brother when I went back yeah, in, like, I, 10 years ago, maybe, when I was still in culinary school, I created this dish one Sunday and it was just out you know reading from uh, cookbooks and stuff like that I decided to kind of put this together this way a certain way and it's a um, cheddar bacon potato pancakes but it's made kind of like a Napoleon stacked with sauteed mushrooms um, rosemary ham uh, sorry not sauteed yeah sauteed no. spinach not mushrooms spinach, spinach rosemary, rosemary ham, ham. 
And then um, egg. They did another, basically another potato pancake, so it's kind of like a, a little cake stacked on top of each other. And then it's got a poached egg and a Mornay sauce, which is just saying it's just, a white cheese sauce. And, it, and it's... Yeah, he it's rotates. <laughs> uh, the brunch menu is different every every week. However, there's certain things that come back. And I haven't I haven't been around for for that week in a while, and I'm missing that dish. So yeah, yeah he, he's got a few that are favorites of mine. But really, everything that's coming out of that kitchen is really fun and interesting. And he did a there, we had an event. The new thing we're doing now, and Tommy can probably talk about it more. What the plan is, is to have a dish that sort of the dish to pair with the event. So we have, yep. we'll have like a brewery event and then he's going to come up with kind of knowing what they do, come up with a special dish that sort of just runs the course of its day or two. And the first one he did was a lobster or a seafood, but mostly lobster. No, it, was, it was straight lobster. It was oh, lobster lobster straight. Chowder. Yep. A lobster chowder. And it was just like, I came in and everyone was like, buzzing about the chowder and i was like is there any left and he's like it's gone but you can have the last little bit so i got the last taste and it was honestly like i just stood there quietly in the past just eating this and just worshiping it so <laughs> congratulations well, on you. all the successes yeah um like she said with that we actually we started decided to do this year differently from what we have done in the past is uh, now incorporating like a, a weekly special to kind of go once a month with the beer events we have we always have uh, beer events on either on Wednesdays or Sundays, and we do like you know two or three in a, a month. But now we're going to do is take one of those and actually make. Uh, I'm a, I'm a design a dish to kind of really either represent something about the brewery or to be something that could be paired with um, the, some of the beers that they're going to have on tap at that time. And which is kind of a difficult thing because it's hard to make a dish that will you know pair nicely with four or five different kinds of beers or even you know twelve beers or something like that. It's like there's they always say have such a different variety that it's kind of hard to make a dish for all of them. But, you know, with that idea, we, you know, I can do a lot of different things where I could even do, like, small bites and, and like, we'll kind of really, you know, have a different range as well of even the dish itself and all that kind of stuff. I have a, 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 a plenty of ideas, but don't know how many all execute them and when they're going to happen. But next one coming up here is actually the 13th um, with Omegon Brewery. Uh, come, and then they have their event, so I'm going to be making a dish to go. Do you know what you're going to make it for that? I don't, actually. <laughs> well, hold on a second. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back in a few minutes to hear more about Tommy's Dishes on Beer Sessions Radio. All right, guys. Good. This one's called My Used to Be by Pamela Royal on the Heritage Radio Network.org. Like what you hear so far? Support the network and become a member. Membership helps us bring you the best food radio in the world and gives you access to thousands of dollars in discounts at the sustainably-minded businesses that support us. To become a member, visit heritageradionetwork.org today. Welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. Do you know you can uh, join and become a member? Go to heritageradionetwork.org. Sign up. We need membership, and uh, you can get special benefits from it. All right. I'm here in the studio with Jen Schwartman and Tommy Harder from Blind Tiger Ale House. We're talking about cooking with beer, and we've got a, a phone guest, uh, a good buddy of Jen's, and, and I've met him as well, Roger Davis. Uh, he's opening a Faction Brewing out in Alameda, California. Hi, Roger. Hey, guys. How are you? <laughs> Good How to are you, hear buddy? From you. Good. How you doing? I'm doing well. I mean, I could be better if I had a brewery up and running. But uh, how's it you know, going? We can get into that. <laughs> well, let's talk about the big story. So we know that uh, you had been a brewer. You worked at Triple Rock, and uh, there was a place called Drake's as well. Yes, I uh, basically I've been a, a professional brewer since '97. 
Uh, I worked at a place in San Francisco called San Francisco Brewing Company, which has since closed. And then I worked at Pyramid. And then I uh, moved on to Drake's and then uh, Triple Rock. And now I'm, uh, hopefully this will be the last brewery I work at, which you know, is the, Faction. The big story that I'll say is when I met you, it was so cool because, you know, Jen introduced us and you came by my place, Jimmy's number 43. But you came out to the East Coast to buy a brewing system. Tell us about how that happened, how, how you made the introduction, and uh, it's, just, it's such a cool thing, And what thing, system right? it is. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, uh, I have known Scott uh, Vaccaro over at Captain Lawrence for a number of years. Um, I worked with one of his uh, school buddies when they were at UC Davis, and then Scott went on to Sierra, and his buddy came and worked with me at Drake's. So I was introduced to Scott at that, uh, at that point, and that was in uh, 2001 or maybe 2002. But uh, then, obviously, I've known Scott for many years and then saw him out in Denver. And uh, we got to talking about his brewery, and he's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to upgrade, and I'm getting a 40-barrel system. I'm moving, like, five miles down the road. Told me the whole story of what, uh, what he was doing the last couple of years. Like, this was in 2010, I guess. And I, was, I just asked him, you know, like, what are you going to do with your, uh, your used equipment? And he's like, well, I'm going to sell it. It's like... Can you sell it to me? <laughs> and, uh, you know, handshake deal right there on the spot in uh, Falling Rock in uh, Denver, which is, uh, you know, kind of a, the go-to bar when you're at the GBF. And it uh, pretty much lit a fire under uh, my wife and I's uh, butts to go ahead and get the business plan all together. And So you knew that it was a plan that you were going to open your own brewery, but you just hadn't gotten that serious about it yet, like taking the time? Exactly. You know, uh, I left Drake's in 2008 to, to focus on, because um, everyone gets in these little ruts in life where you just, you're doing the same thing and you're, like, you're getting away from like, the big goal. Yeah. And my big goal was always to open a brewery. So I left Drake's thinking that would be like, the fire under my butt to like, you know, get this thing going to open my own brewery. And it just, it just was bad timing. So then I, uh, I ended up going back into brewing, and that's when I got the job at Triple Rock. And um, about a year and a half or two years into that, I was like, wow, I'm back in this rut that I didn't want to be in. And that's right when we saw Scott. So it was like, whoa. Yeah. Well, Roger, let's, let's talk about your, your journey to get this brewing system because I think that's cool. And it represents, like, what's cool about being a brewer in America. So you, you, you dro- tell us the whole trip. You drove to the East Coast. You, you, how, how did you, you know, just tell us this whole little nitty-gritty stuff because I, I love it. Well, we, uh, I mean, like I said, we know, we, I've known Scott for many years, and then uh, he was like, well, I'm not going to sell it to you unless you come out. So we, uh, my wife and I came out in April of uh, 2011, and um, we hung out. We sh- he showed us all the equipment. We're like, okay, we'll take it, blah, blah, blah. You know, just tell us, tell us what you want to uh, charge us, and we'll, we'll start raising the money. And so we got to that, and then uh, I came out again in February of last year, and that's when we just kind of ripped it out of his old building up in uh Yeah, I saw you on that trip. And you brought out your uh, GC, too, right? Or a contractor sort of friend? Yeah, yeah. I brought out um, a contractor because uh, it turns out I'm really good at taking things apart. <laughs> but putting them back together is not really my forte. <laughs> So somebody with another set of eyes to figure exactly. it out. Yeah, someone, very good. Someone that could take pictures, or I'd just rip it all apart and be like, all right, where's the box we put this in? And yeah, I'm missing some bolts. <laughs> so what did you do? Did you, did you drive well, it back? Spare parts. Did you drive it back in a truck, or did you have it shipped? We ended up having it shipped. We ended up buying pretty much everything that he had up in Westchester, because he, um, he, it is, or Pleasantville. Yeah. Pleasantville is where he was. Yep. Um, he basically bought all new stuff. So everything that was uh, on his old site was for our, us to take. So, uh, so you got pretty much that, what you need, having, right? It was about five truckloads. Wow. But what, what I don't know about, about brewing in America, so you came all the way from California to New York to buy a used brewing system. Uh, so first of all, it must have been a good deal. Uh, well, I mean, uh, it was a good deal, but uh, it's also nowadays karma. with all these breweries <laughs> popping up, if you... Uh, if you can even buy something on the used market, it's it's basically gone within like five minutes of them posting it on a forum. So there's there's Plus scarcity. Plus, he also knew that there was like by knowing Scott, he knew that Scott had taken care of his system. That you know, I mean, there's a certain that's important too to like yeah. not take on well, equipment. I, I, knew, I knew it was obviously producing great beer, and uh, just knowing Scott would take care of it the whole nine yards, and it was 
it was really the size that we were looking for too. It's a twenty barrel system, which is a great, great system for uh, for production to start up at. Now you hadn't found the space for the brewery yet. You bought the equipment, and of course, you still had to find a place to house it. Yes, that's, that's so where you, the whole dilemma came in. Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> but you managed to. I mean, you're you're on track now. I mean, I know that took a while, but you know. Where yeah, are you? We, uh, unfortunately, the brewery, the brewery uh, is still in storage right now. We are hitting a lot of red tape, um, uh-huh. a lot of, a lot of uh, just BS that basically is we didn't anticipate. It's um, always got to be like something. Said, we were out there in February and took it out, and we actually stored it in New York for about three months. And then I found a place out here in Santa Rosa, which is about an uh, hour, hour and a half north of us, who could store it. So that's where it's sitting now. But we basically, um, we haven't even started constructing the brewery yet. So, Roger, also, tell us about the, the, the choices and the, the effort you put into choosing a location for a brewery. Uh, well, we actually, I wanted to move to this, uh, or move the brewery to this place called Richmond, which is... Um, it's not really the nicest part of uh, the Bay Area, but uh, we would have been the first brewery to ever open there. So uh, we actually had this building. It was all picked out. We were, we were going back and forth, the landlord, and um, basically they were offering it for anywhere between 55 and 65 cents. So we came in at like 55 cents a square foot, uh-huh. and they came back at like 75 cents. We're like, all right, screw this. So um, that night, Claudia, my wife, uh, was just on the Internet, and um, she woke me up at like 2 in the morning. She was like, I found the location. (laughs) And um, it's this place that is literally right next door to St. George Spirits, which makes the Hangar One Vodka, as well as a bunch of other really good spirits. But it's on the old Navy base of uh, Alameda. It is a hangar, I'm actually looking out right now, and all I see is San Francisco. In the Bay Bridge. Wow, amazing. And it is like a hangar, right? I mean, yeah, that's why a, it's hangar literally one, a hangar yeah. where they used to put the plans. The building right. is 65,000 square feet. Wow. Yeah. But uh, we are only taking half of it, so we get 32 and a half. But um, it's huge. I can, I'll send you guys pictures uh, when I get off the phone. W- yeah. One thing I read, I mean, we, we met last year, and it was really great meeting you, but I read some of the, as you were searching for a location, because I know that's a big part of, of opening a brewery, you said you didn't want to go in an area where you knew other brewers and you didn't want to have to be competing for their tap lines, it sounded really cool. Just tell us more about your philosophy. You know, you've, you've been brewing and, and buddies with all these other brewers, so now you're on your own. You know, what, what do you feel like is yours for the taking, you know? And that was really interesting what you said. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just, uh, I've been in the industry for a long time, and I just don't really want to step on people's toes. You know, it's, I, I, I realize how hard it is to sell a beer. And to, Competition's to, fierce. to come in and then like just start taking people off tap and being like, "Hey, you got to carry my beer," you know, with that philosophy is just, it. It I don't think it works very well in in today's world. So our whole theory was just to kind of spread out a little bit more because um, the production, what Scott was doing was about eight thousand barrels. So I figure we can do close to seven thousand barrels. Not right away, obviously. We'll grow into that. But, uh, you know, just kind of, like, spread it out a little bit more and not not tread on people's toes and not, like, you know. But what's great, too, is by being sharing the space next door with the distillery, you're not, you're not treading, you know, it's not another brewery. It's not direct competition, but it's all very similar mindset. Yeah. So it it's, it's, a de- it's uh, going to be a destination a, a in Alameda. like, two doors down, too. So it's oh, like really? a cohesive oh. unit now. It's like... Wow. We're the final uh, piece of the puzzle. It's a reason to go to Alameda. Exactly. Heck yeah. Maybe they'll have a ferry from San Francisco or something. Well, yeah, how do you do, get there actually. from the city? It's about, a, it's about a 15, 20 minute walk, but uh, it's, it's definitely uh, something that a lot of people do right now going to St. George. And that, I mean, that brings it back to like rounding out the whole like location thing for us. Is when we were looking at Richmond, we, we weren't really planning on having a tasting room that was going to be booming. So uh, when we moved over here to Alameda, I mean, literally, when I send you guys pictures, you're going to be like, whoa. I've seen um, a picture. You showed me a picture. We're going to have like huge. a deck out here, and it's, it's going to be a booming tasting room. Wow. Hey, another question. So um, 
Tell us a little bit about the difficulties you're facing in, in getting open. Uh, right now, it's just a lot of it is permits. We've uh, submitted permit uh, for permitting twice now and gotten rejected twice. Um, there's a uh, there's a lot of things that go on. I mean, we could talk about this for like three hours, <laughs> but uh, right now, the city of Alameda does not own the land. The Navy still does. Ah. So anything that we do, the city's like, yeah, you can do that, but we have to go see what the Navy says. And the Navy's priority is not faction brewing, obviously. It's, you know, doing other things. So that's, we put in for permitting in July, and we didn't get an answer from um, the Navy until Thanksgiving. Oh, yeah. That's kind of painful. Yeah, that's a lot and, of time. Um, actually, it's, the, the building that we're in is a landmark now, so... A lot of stuff has to go to SHPO, which is the state historical. Uh, I don't know what the IPO means, but uh, they basically, they took their sweet time. Everyone has like a month to like figure things out, and it seems like they're waiting 29 days. Sounds like we need to write letters to the president on this one. <laughs> Wouldn't yeah, that exactly. be fun? I mean, that would be a cool campaign. Write a letter to the president and have him support the brewery in Alameda, California. Exactly. And yeah. that's what they well, want, right? You turn the these old is, Navy uh, bases into this, taxpayers. This, uh, you know? hangar that we're in was a Marine hangar on a Navy base. And I had some guy that came out, and uh, he was going to help us with our boiler. But uh, he was actually stationed in this hangar. Huh. And he actually, because the Marines, I guess, could give a little bit more um, protection. All the presidents, when they did their uh, Bay Area trips, came through this hangar. <laughs> Which was kind of cool. So what he was having? So flash- there is a lot of history. Was this guy there. having flashbacks or something? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all for it, but I would say this: I think that you know the government is trying to generate more money, and uh, you know it sounds like they should get moving on getting you guys in there. Yeah, I'm all for I mean, it. The, uh, it's it's frustrating and a long story, but I won't get completely into it. But uh, hopefully, um, we just got re- our second rejection last week, and. We have a big meeting with the general contractor and all the subcontractors and the architect and everyone on Thursday. And uh, we just need to hammer it out, get it correct, and then submit and just be like, okay, here so, you go. So the Hangar 1 guys, I mean, what did they have to go through to get their approval when they started? I mean, how lo- that was quite a while ago, right? How- yeah. They have been uh, in the Hangar next to us for a, a little over 10 years, but the, I think they've been on the base for about 20 Oh. So they just kind of moved, and um, they moved. They they closed this base down in '96, and Hangar or St. George Spirits moved into the hangar next to us. Uh, I believe in like 2001. But they were already so part of, of the system. Yeah. Um, so time is on their side, but they were already on on naval. Yeah, it's it's, it's all very yeah, interesting. Yeah. It's all very interesting. All this stuff. But one thing I I did read is that. But you said Alameda, the city, is behind you. So I'm sure that at some point, you know, this will all come together. Uh, Roger, will you stay on the line with us? We're going to take a short break. Of course. We'll be back in a few minutes on Beer Sessions Radio. This one's called Hard on the Line by Pamela Royal on the Heritage Radio Network.org. Every Tuesday at 12 p.m., you can call food scientist Dave Arnold and ask any question you want. John from Chicago, you're on the air. Hey, hey, Dave. Looking at sales. Who am I fooling? This is horrible stuff. Without glutamic acid, you die. It is a matter of taste, but there's a lot more fat in sausage than you think. Get ahead of the curve. Tune into Cooking Issues every Tuesday at 12 p.m. on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Whose show do you love more than Dave Arnold's cooking issues on the Heritage Radio Network? I love, hey, it's, it's 
Roger from Alameda, California. Yay. That's how that's how Dave talks. It's cool. He's got a lot of energy. We got Tommy from Blind Tiger here right now. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> so we got Roger on. We're talking about trying to get open in Alameda. You know what we're drinking, Roger? We're drinking these wild stuff, Yeasty Boys from New Zealand. And uh, they have what they call the smokiest beer in the world, the Rex Attitude. It's very um, peat smoky. I think it's a hundred percent. It's not like rock. It's not. Yeah, it's a hundred percent. It's a little more ashtray smoked, yeah. but it goes really well with this pizza. The speck, as Tommy pointed out, the smokiness of the speck on the pizza that we had um, does kind of. I I think the the beer benefits from the pizza. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, especially because it's a little overwhelming. The mushrooms, the blue cheese, all that stuff that's on the pizza. Also, you know, it's more earthy of a pizza, and so this one definitely. Um, went, lends itself much more to it, but the yeah, food, food and beer combinations. You're, you know, yeah. something sour beer with with a uh, fatty food often often equals a very balanced flavors. Roger, let's talk a little about uh, the California beer scene. Now, um, I know out here we get we get beers from Europe and all over, um, but you've been in, enmeshed in the California beer scene. So, what else is going out there that that you like? You know, what are the small breweries that that you, that you really like? And Any some newcomers of aside yeah, from newcomers. you that you are friends with who are doing a really good job. There, uh, there's no good beer out here. Yeah, you guys. Yeah, it's been a wasteland for so long. Yeah, California has nothing going on. <laughs> no, there's, uh, there's, there's not so many uh, breweries popping up um, right now. So, mi- so much as like uh, a lot of restaurants are turning into multi taps, uh, which yeah. is awesome. Because, We've seen that here you too. Know, of course, a lot of these restaurants realize that uh, rotating the taps is really going to bring people in. Yeah. So that's uh, that's kind of w- the way that everything's shifting out here. Um, obviously, there's I think there's a bunch of breweries opening in San Diego, but uh, you can't really get those beers up here yet. But the Bay Area, I'll, I'll be honest, has been pretty stagnant for a little while. Um, hasn't really been anything opening. It's it's really interesting because I, you know, I have my own theories about that. I go back, you know, at least once a year, and I was like, this is crazy how few beer bars there are in San Francisco and and how and I'm just like I don't understand but I I think it's because it's so deeply entrenched that it's yeah. taken for granted in ways that it's not taken for granted even in places like San Diego because that's a rel- relatively new market a relatively new boom and it's like once it gets to that point where like I remember going into a brunch place that would close at 3 p.m. you know and it would have three or four awesome beers on tap and so I was like, yeah. it just is everywhere. And they're local, you know, the, the, these great breweries that have been around forever that everyone counts on. Their quality is really high. And people just expect to find good beer where they go. So they're not yeah. necessarily like eager seeking it out with that fire where a lot of these new markets, they're so excited. And, you know, we're in New York now where... It's like they are re- the consumer base is really excited. And so they're just like they want something new and different all the time. And there's something nice about the maturity of adulthood where you're like you can like settle into quality and and have breweries that are tried and true that you really, you know, that you truly love and know won't let you na- let you down. But there's also like this little bit of a lack of interest about anything else. It's a little provincial. And uh, so what, what, what are some of those breweries? I mean, we know Sierra Nevada. Well, we definitely know Sierra Nevada, but of course, you've got well, Russian I mean, River Russian and River's Moonlight. All over the place out here, and Lagunitas. Lagunitas and Bear Republic, yeah. and Twenty yeah. First Amendment is there with their great pub, and and now these guys are going to come on the scene, but with a nice pedigree from the region, you know, and so people know Roger and and yeah, Drake's and Triple Rock, and I there there are so many great breweries in the region that supply the region really well. And so the consumer market, I think, you know, it's kind of nice to see places like Zeitgeist, which I've always really liked. They have a great garden. They're in the mission. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's, you know, it's always been one of my favorite, my other, besides the Toronado, my favorite beer bar. And it, they did put in a much bigger tap system and they have a lot more beer in the last couple yeah. of years. And that was good to see because I felt like that was sort of like they were kind of, they saw their potential to maximize what they were doing and to really promote even more beer. And uh, so that was great. And so it feels like there are a few more breweries, Rosamund opening up their, you know, actual nope. restaurant that's also a beer bar. They're, they're, and Pie, those guys are great. I know quite a few. I don't know everyone there, but it seems like there is more of an interest, but it's still kind of interesting how San Francisco, which in many ways is a hub, is like a little bit lackadaisical. Yeah, it's 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 kind of frustrating 
to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. But uh, living in Oakland, where I where I live. Oh, Oakland's and then booming. Beer Revolution. I mean, the Trappist is uh, is open now. Another place in Oakland. They're they're looking to actually open a place in the city. Uh-huh. Pretty soon as well. Uh, Rosa Monday just opened, and they just opened in Br- Brooklyn too, I believe. Yeah, I saw. Yeah, they did. But uh, I mean, oh, uh, there's a lot of things to be said about San Francisco. Obviously, the high rent is probably going to be an issue. So that's like pushing a lot of the restaurant tours right now over here to Oakland, right? Um, because the rent's a lot cheaper, and Oakland's kind of Oakland not is like the Brooklyn completely backwards. But they're you know letting it- everyone do whatever they want, whereas in San Francisco, there's a lot of... Oakland is really the Brooklyn of San Francisco. It's exactly. close, it's right over the water, very easy to get to, and still sort of a frontier where, you know, there's some pockets that are super, you know, already really gentrified, but then yep. a lot of expansive space where there's a lot of potential. And so it's, it's super similar. I've always made that analogy. Roger, yeah, uh, that's did, a you, good analogy. did you ever find any potential locations for your brewery in Oakland? We were kind of looking in Oakland, but then that goes back to what I was, uh, my whole philosophy, which was like I didn't want to step on people's toes. Um, there's a couple breweries in Oakland. Uh, Oakland, unfortunately, has this, um, this thing where you can't do manufacturing past a certain street, which is like right about downtown. So out in the neighborhoods where everyone lives, uh, you couldn't open a brew pub. Right. Because brewing is light manufacturing. Right. So all the breweries, like Linden Street, which uh, I can actually, I mean, if I was, maybe not Barry Bonds, but uh, Alex Rodriguez, <laughs> uh, actually he's on steroids too, isn't he? <laughs> so uh, I, I can't keep track. <laughs> but you could probably throw a baseball and hit Linden Street, but to drive there is about 20 minutes because we're on the island, you know. Right. So it's, um, I just didn't, I didn't want to get it in anyone's way, you know, it's like, I, I, I just respect everyone that's done, who, who's paved the way, essentially, for us. And Roger, you're a very cool guy. Let's jump it, because we've got a few minutes left. Tell us about, when you open Faction, you know, do you have some beers in mind that you're going to make first, and what styles of beer will you be making? Um, yeah, actually, we, we did all that in our business plan, which is basically, uh, we're going to come out with uh, five different series of beers. Uh, we're going to do, like, uh, everyday beers. We're going to do a little bit more strong beers. We're going to do uh, a Belgian line. We're going to do um, barrel-aged beers, barrel-aged clean beers, mm-hmm. and then uh, sour beers. So we're going to have five different uh, series of beers. Uh, and you've got space for some barrels, too. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we, we do. Um, we're going to have uh, three different coolers, so we're going to put all the uh, sour beers in a cooler and all the barrel-aged beers in a cooler as well, just to temperature control them and keep everything like where it needs to be. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we definitely have space, but, um, you know, it's amazing. When, when we first started looking at uh, spaces, we were looking at like 10,000, 8,000 square feet. And then we saw this building, and it was like, wow, 65,000 square feet. We can take half of this. And then you just start thinking about things, and you're like, wow, that building's already filled. <laughs> yeah. Roger, it's, it's really great talking to you, and we're rooting for you. And I swear to God, I'm going to write a letter to the president. But we've also been talking <laughs> about cooking with beer with Chef Tommy Harder. Yeah. Do you have a favorite uh, beer and food pairing of your, of your own? I'm sorry, do I? Uh, yeah. yeah, do you have a favorite f- uh, food and beer? Oh, pairing? yeah, I'm a, um, I really like uh, Imperial Stouts with uh, chocolate. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, classic. Yeah, yeah I don't, you know, it's it, it that's works. one of my favorites. Yeah. That's all you need, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that and uh, uh, fire at night, you know, it's, it's I'm done. Yeah. The, the one that always struck me, it was from one of uh, Garrett Oliver's books, it was so simple and basic. You take a, a good barley wine, and you have it with a good blue cheese. And they, they really I – f- I feel like a good food and food pairing, you actually balance it out. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, that's, you, do, you have your imperial stout and, and your chocolate, and then you have the barley wine and the blue cheese. And that's a party. Oh, yeah. Sounds like a Valentine's <laughs> date. Well, I have some uh, Point Reyes uh, at the house. I'll have to go try that. Yeah. All right. Go get some Bigfoot on the way home. <laughs> so, Tommy, let's, let's, let's talk to Tommy one more time. Sure. Uh, so Tommy's a cooks with beer. Um, so you've got you're doing an Oma Gang a night coming up. What yep. what foods w- would you do with Oma Gang? Oh, Oma Gang just being also um, a Belgian brewery and stuff like that. I always kind of think about what would do you know, a, a classic Belgian dish maybe with them. 
Um, I have a lot of experience with Omegon because I've also been you know, to their BCTC and done cooking competitions uh, the last two years now. Um, two years ago, I took the, the muscle tussle, which was uh, the <laughs> Belgium. Uh, it was just we had muscles, and there was five different chefs, six different chefs, sorry. And we competed, but we all got paired up with one of their beers to use and pair and- with. Yeah. And so it's something like that. Was Tommy took that award. Yeah, they ended up winning that one. Yeah, that one was my big, uh, my big claim to fame that kind of got my whole, the whole thing started for me. Really, I like actually got my name out there and stuff. But uh, they had something like that too. I mean, I almost thought about maybe during, bringing it back and doing another a muscle dish, but. You know, it's just because kind of bringing that. And then there was one more competition this year in Cooperstown. It was like different chefs pairing with with food. What was that competition? Yeah, that one actually they called it was the Hop Chef. That was this last uh, this last summer, like was August or whatever when we were up there. And um, what all the other chefs happened to do is they are in different areas like Washington D.C. There was one in Baltimore, I think, and one in Albany. They actually had these competitions. And all these chefs won that competition to come to BCTC to compete for the the main event, the, the grand finale. And since I won the year before, I came back as well. So it was me and three other chefs. And that one was something that's totally different. We actually could plan out our dish. We had just like a basically a stipend. Of so what was money. your menu? Because I, I, I remember you, you did something good. Yeah, I made actually a play on a like a basically like a you know crab cake, but I used uh, braised duck. Um, so you know, kind of in the same you know form, you know, it'd be kind of shaped in the same way, but instead of using fish or you know seafood or something like that, I actually used uh, braised duck legs, and I cooked them in the Abbey L. And that was the other thing too about the competition is that we could uh, choose whatever beer we wanted to out of the Omegon range uh, of beers to pair with. We didn't get it specifically like I got paired up with this beer or I got paired up with the wit or whatever. So I chose the Abbey L. Um, thought it'd be something to be different. And some that like we could you know that would like maybe stick out because usually a lot of people only know really more of like the hennepin or the omega wit. That was like oh if I do something different maybe I'll kind of like stick out a little bit. So with that I actually infuse a lot of flavors that are also like you can kind of find and taste already in the abbey of like sun dried tomatoes and figs and uh, you know different uh, different like ingredients like that like they're just naturally kind of present in the beer itself. Um, they also, I mean, Omegon's kind of crazy too, is that they do a lot of their beers, they do add other flavors into like the cooking process or the, the beer brewing process, you know, they'll add coriander seeds or whatever to which beer it was. And so that one, like I already kind of had standing out, but I did a, so I did a, uh, a duck cake, but I also infused it with a lot of foie gras and I made also a foie gras mousse that also was, uh, infused with figs and, and made a sauce out of the bracing liquid, the Abbey Ale bracing liquid, made into a mole, um, using um, basically different kinds of chili peppers and all that kind of stuff. So there was a lot of things going on. Finished it all off. I took the the duck skin and made those into some cracklings, kind of get a little crispy and some go on top. So it was like I said, a lot of things going on. But I unfortunately did not take it, take the winning. <laughs> I got third, I guess, in that that competition. Yeah, I think the judges were prejudiced, you know, <laughs> but. Uh... Uh, but, I was one of the judges. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> we had a cool guys. We had guys from Star Chefs and Savoir Magazine. It was a pretty big time thing. I mean, if, if you haven't been, listeners, uh, check out every summer. It's the Oma Gang's Belgian Come to Cooperstown event. John goes up every year. I go up. Dave oh, yeah. Broderick. It's My it's really the, the best beer Coast. event. Yeah. And uh, Roger, hopefully you know next time you might come out in August yourself. You'd have a great time. Yeah, uh, it sounds like fun. I, I I'm suddenly very hungry. You know, you guys out, out, out west. What, what's the big, the big, uh, the when everyone goes to the desert and Burning Man. Burning Man. Yeah. You got Burning Man. We got Belgian comes to Cooperstown. It's a little different. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a little I, more I, civilized. Burning Man. I'd rather go to Cooperstown. Yeah, Cooperstown. Yeah, there's a great farm museum with hop exhibits. It's it's really if you want to take a beer trip in the summer, I really recommend going to Cooperstown because the, the farm museum's great and they really have a uh, this 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 working hop area and uh, you can learn about that was the the. You know the headquarters of of hop growing in the Northeast in the 1800s. And I've already oh, nice. determined when I moved to the West Coast that the one the one event a year that will mark my annual visit back to the New York region is going to be BCTC. It's hands down the best. It wouldn't be the event. same without. And Jen, we know you have something secret and big coming up. In the next I have something weeks. that I can't announce officially until tomorrow, and it kills me because it's really fun. But next week but we'll mention I'm going to do my okay. best to kick ass. All right, That's I'm going to do a shout-out, too. Actually, tonight in New to York, well. uh, <laughs> a, a number of our guests, including Sam Merritt, Mary Isaac, and myself, we were a part of this weird panel last year. 
Uh, we sat in with Mr. George Riedel, the the ultimate dean of glassware in America. Uh, they were deciding on, on the proper shape for a Spiegel Out IPA glass. And there's a party tonight at Nomad Hotel in Manhattan. And I'm, I'm going to go there after the show. Um, and we'll see what he picked, Mr. George Riedel himself picked for the uh, the IPA glass. It's going to be fun. And uh, Sam Colagione from Dogfish Head is going to be there. So what we're trying to do out here is... Uh, Get you guys interested in all these fun things. Coming up, uh, one thing uh, Beer Sessions Radio is, is producing for the New York City Beer Week for the third annual uh, New York City Brewers Choice. Dave Broderick, uh, the Blind Tiger owner, is curating all the beers. It's mostly Northeast Regional Brewers. The brewers will be there with their top beers, pouring it themselves with great food pairings. And it's a great super event. Via- There's only a couple hundred tickets left. Uh, so if, if I were you, it's, only, it's still $60. It's a great event. It's probably the best. Best event of New York City Beer Week. In New York City. In yeah. New York City. Yeah, I'm happy to see yeah. you and also be part of it as well. Uh, thank you, Tommy. And I wanted to ask you, you, you didn't tell me what you were going to cook. Oh, yes. I, I'm still Did uh, you figure it out yet yeah. tonight? Um, I'm thinking of actually doing uh, some uh, braised pork belly. It's going to be the main of the, the dish. So Can't lose with that. See, I, I think you should make your, your duck <laughs> crab cakes. <laughs> well, I did that once, so it's, Give like, I got to do something different. I like All right. that. Well, Roger, I just got this photo, and the view from the brewery is phenomenal. Uh, did you get that? I got that. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> Everyone's going to have to visit this well, Jen, place. Just we can to put it up, if you can email it up, we can put it on our Facebook or yeah, something. Yeah, I will. I'll get this just, to you. But just imagine uh, having a deck out there. I know. It's like the biggest deck ever. Oh, it'll be and, fantastic. And the beauty is uh, there's runways out there, and there's a bird that's endangered that lives out there, so they'll never build on that. Oh. Really? Nice. Awesome. Hey, guys, we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, we've got another show coming on. It's Erica Wilde. She's got a great show on after us. But, again, uh, get your tickets for New York City Brewer's Choice. It's at City Winery in New York City, February 27th. It's the featured event of the New York City Beer Week. Go to goodbrewseal.com for tickets. And in closing, I'd like to thank our sponsors at greatbrewers.com who have helped to bring the podcast to you tonight. And Beer Sessions Radio is also supported by the Good Beer Seal. Thanks to Jen, Tommy, and Roger for joining me here on the Heritage Radio Network. I'm Jimmy Carboni. Thanks to our producers, Jack Ensley, Brie O'Connor, and our engineer, Joe Galarraga. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. And Roger, on- say hi to Claudia for me. All right, <laughs> on Beer Sessions Radio. Good luck to you, Roger. Thank you. Right. Thanks for listening to this program on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at heritageradionetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening.